Daniel chapter 3. I failed to announce, um, is it this, it's this week, isn't it, Dave, Diane? 50 years. Congratulations. Yeah. Dave was telling me earlier that they're looking to take a, a little vacation with the family, and what a joy that is. 50 years of marriage, and you think about 30, and, and just our society, and that seems to be a number that's unattainable to some people. Uh, a lot of that is because of their own selfishness and sin, but uh, we rejoice in the fact that God has sustained your marriage and your life, so congratulations. <clears throat> Let me read our text this morning. We're in Daniel chapter 3, and it's a narrative passage that kind of flows within the life of, of these three young men in, in their interaction with King Nebuchadnezzar and an idol. It's been a couple of weeks since, since we've been here, and, and I want to get the, the truth in your mind here, and we'll launch off of this text into examining what does it mean to have biblical faith. Starting in verse 1 of Daniel 3, it says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, the height of which is 60 cubits, its width 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent word to Assemble the sastraps, the, the perfects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the providence to come to dedicate, or to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And the sastraps, the perfects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the providences were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed to you, the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of the, fire, of the furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that, that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the ministration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. The Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and, or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach. Meshach and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of a blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Profound. Profound faith in the midst of great adversity. 
A faith that didn't waver. A faith that stood firm. Let us pray. Father, we again this morning ask that you would be with our hearts as we stir our minds towards this great account. You are the living God who gives boldness in the times of great adversity. We marvel at the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We, we, we count it great pleasure to, to know the same God to whom they stood for. And we ask, Lord, that you would teach us this morning. That we would check our own hearts in the midst of today. That we would try to understand what it means to have such uncompromising faith. And so we ask, Lord, that you will teach us. Spirit, have your way with our souls. And with the word of God, may it cement into us this resolve that we will stand for you. I ask that you be with your servant, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. There's an old story I read this week about a ship that was wrecked at sea. And a young man was washed onto a rock formation. Cleaning for his wife, for his, not his wife, but his life. Let me get my lips. As the storm raged that night, he was found next morning clinging to this rock. They rescued the young man and, and, and brought him to safety. They, of course, had some questions for him. Once aboard the ship, they, they made sure he was okay. And, and then they started asking him certain questions. They wanted to know how he made it through a storm that, that wrecked a big ship. They asked us questions. Were you fearful? Did you ever think that you were going to make it? What kept you through into the night? Did you cry? Did you shiver? And he said yes to all that. All that happened. He said, I was fearful. I was shaking. And I was afraid. But through it all, the rock didn't move. Utter faith in, in something as such tangible as that. Beloved, for us as Christians, we have a rock that does not move. It is our stability no matter what ages come our way. Spiritually speaking, when, when the world comes crashing in on our lives like a storm, in which it will, if it hasn't already, and when your lives are threatened, and when the world commands us to conform to their ideologies and to its culture, we hold on to the rock. It is our great God that we see here in Daniel chapter 3 that, that these three young Hebrew boys were, were clinging to. They, they were taking a stand. They had already made up in their minds of the hill that they're going to die on. And idol worship was not going to be the, be, be the issue. They're not going to capitulate their faith to, to, to bow down to the king's wishes, for they knew that that blasphemed their holy God. And they were able to stand against the king and stand firm. Scripture tells us in Hebrews 13, 8, that, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's no variance or shifting shadows. He is completely in control of this world. We have an unchanging God. A God that is just as he was in Daniel chapter 3, is the same God who was for us in 2018. And he does mighty things to show his glory and to, to, to show his strength and to strengthen the faith of those who, who call upon him. And what we have just read in Daniel chapter 3 is three young men who didn't waver. I think from a distance, we, we, we marvel that. We look at a, at a text like this and, and see the, the narrative unfold and, and the resolve of these three young men, and we say, that is profound. I wish I had that type of faith. Beloved, you can. 
like I said, this God who doesn't change is it's the same God who has delivered, as we will see, Lord willing, next week, uh, this, these three men out of, the, out of the fiery furnace. It's pretty remarkable if you were to read the whole account of Daniel 3, just, just all what God has done to show his hand that the three went in, but four were there. And yet Scripture tells us, and we'll see this next week, that, that they never even smelt like fire. Reminds me of family camp and the whole issue of just being around the outdoors and, and smelling things and smoke and not even a smell, not even a hair singed upon them. What gave these young men hope that they can face the most powerful king at that time, King Nebuchadnezzar, who had the whole empire in front of him. Scripture is very replete about the fact that, that he called all the magistrates and, and, and all the, the governors and, and all the counselors and all the treasurers. Everybody was bowing down except for these three men. Scripture, I, I, I guess you've got to ask yourself, where's Daniel in the midst of this? No, he must be away. But you can see in Daniel's life, he stood just as what if he was there with these three young men. And if you start thinking, and this got me thinking about this whole issue of faith, what compelled them to rebel against the king's wishes, especially when he had the ability to kill them? And he, and he put that out there to them. They no doubt as young Hebrew slaves who, who, who remember in, in the context and the history were, were exiled to Babylon to, to be um, conformed into Babylonian thought. They were... the, the Top choice, some scholars believe there was roughly 27 of them. They were, they were all brought into this pagan king's uh, room to, to be assimilated towards the things of Babylonian thought and pagan worship. And yet, they didn't capitulate. Why? No doubt in the raising, they knew stories of how awesome and mighty God has been in their life. They no doubt had parents who told them about the mighty hand of God delivering them out of Egypt and the many miracles that were, were passed down, this heritage of this faith of this living God. They heard story after story of, of how God delivered them and provided for them and brought them into the promised land and the many miracles and provisions that came with it. And how they gave them a land that wasn't theirs. It's interesting to me that these three young men, they, even though they were in a foreign land, they were slaves to a, a, a foreign king. Their situation seemed to be a futile. They still had living faith that rocked the king. Remember, they've already seen in their own lives what, what God had done in, in Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2 with a particular diet and, and finding favor in the king's court to, to be obedient to the things of God. Even when things were difficult. And they saw God reveal this interpretation of this dream to Daniel. And so they, they have seen the hand of God move. They knew their allegiance was to him alone. And they held on to the rock. They held on to, to this living God. They believed that he would do one of two things. You know, that they would be rescued. Or that they would die and be in his presence. In both situations, they knew it was a win-win. It's very remarkable to me. The, the heart of this passage is, is there again in, in, in Daniel 3, verse 16 through 18. Look again at those scriptures. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king. And if you noticed earlier, just, just how the, the other Chaldeans responded to the king. They gave flattery. They said, oh, king, live forever. They were trying to find favor. These Chaldeans were, were against the, the faith of these Jews. They noticed that they stood. And would they stand out? Absolutely. 
As, every, as the sound, the musicians sounded, and everybody bowed, they stood. They were easy to point out. There was probably some jealousy behind these Chaldeans. They, they were probably, no doubt, uh, not liking the fact that, as we saw at the end of Daniel chapter 2, that they were promoted to, to prominence and found favor in the king. There was jealousy, and there was wickedness in their heart. And so they come to the king and remind him of his, his command. And Shadrach, verse 16, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If we were to stop there, we would think, oh boy. They probably came to their wits. They probably thought to themselves, we need to bow down. We need to, we need to give in. Notice that they didn't knee jerk, however. They were resolved to take a stand. Verse 17 If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Their faith was remarkable. However, you need to look at this. They had no idea to predict what was going to happen next. They had no idea if God was going to deliver them or not. But yet they had a faith in the living God to deliver them. And they also had faith to understand that even if they weren't delivered, that his goodness and kindness was able to resurrect them into his presence. They didn't cave in. They, they stood their ground. They had hoped in God. And get this, what is key about these verses, they didn't presume that God would do what they wanted. They left it all to God. They trusted their, this God to, to do what was best according to their lives. Why? Because they had already tasted that. They had already seen, you and I both know that, that, that faith really, it, when we have faith in something, it's only as good as the substance that we put our faith in. In particular, your God, this, this living God who had shown his grace and kindness to them. They knew that God had their best in mind. And they no doubt, like you and I, were, were longing for the day to see him face to face. And they stared death with the assurance that God had them. And they stood and looked at the king and, and proclaimed that even if they die in the fiery furnace, they weren't going to cave in and blaspheme their God. They were living like the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, where he said, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. It's a win-win for them. And it's a win-win for you and I. They were set apart for such this time, and God desired to use them as a tool in his hand to be a great reminder for us on how mighty God does in the midst of great adversity. That we don't need to put our tail between our legs and run. When the world says you must be conformed to this or you must do that, they stood firm. They were set apart, and they stood firm. They stood in faith in the living God, and they did not waver they didn't even flinch. It's remarkable. Biblical faith, living faith, a trust in something. They weren't there to try to earn God's favor. They were there living in the grace of what God has supplied. And beloved, we must understand that the biblical faith that is displayed by these three young men is not confident it's not confidence in the outcomes, but confidence in the God who brings the outcomes. We trust that he knows what we cannot discern. It doesn't mean that they weren't necessarily wondering what's going to happen next, because they were. And it's remarkable to me, as we'll see next week, that, that they actually went and God allowed them to be inserted into the fiery furnace. And yet, he protected them there. He 
protected them there. We trust that God knows what we do not know. Plans, they didn't anticipate it. They trusted in him. They knew that their security was was wrapped up in him. Our trust is not the the quantity of our, uh, or the quality of our faith. No, our trust is in the confidence of a living God who does all things according to his glory. And get this, everything that he does is good. Any other perspective will be harm to your soul. Will be harm to your soul. Why do I say that? Because the world redefines what biblical faith is. And so it is my desire for us to to kind of slow down and, and kind of take us through the scriptures over the next few weeks. To help us understand exactly what true biblical faith is and what it's not. I mean, this is remarkable faith. But more important, this is a remarkable God who delivered them out of their their trial and their adversity. They had given their lives. They understood what heel to die on. And they did not waver because they believed in this mighty God to deliver them or to bring them into his presence. And it all came down to faith. They determined what hill they were going to die on and whom they desired to give honor and live their lives for before the adversity was even there. They held internal conviction. They they had internal principles. They, They believed in the only and living God. And their faith, as it was put on display for us to see, will be theirs for all eternity. And it's the same faith that he calls you and me to live today. Why? Just as our God doesn't change, the faith in the living God doesn't change. Our faith is rested in in the character and the awesomeness of who our God is. He is our hope, beloved. And so, to some degree, we walk around with such confidence, not in ourselves, but in the mighty God who delivers us out of all trials. And so you can see by your outline, I want us to grasp the significance of of what it means to live by faith. I want us to understand what what God and the scriptures call faith and make sure we don't have any holes in that because adversity is coming. Trials are coming. The world is pressing in on you. And the question you got to ask yourself, will I honor God? Will I honor God or will I fall? Will I be ashamed and fall and bow down and give in to the world? I'll share with you a a little thing that happened last week at the radio station. I want you to continue to pray for this because this is a remarkable opportunity because they put us on a, a secular station, a talk show. And we're talking about Christ. I'm able to open up the scriptures and preach the scriptures and, and allow them to hear the word of God. After that show a couple weeks ago, the general manager called us in. I looked at Paul. I said, I think we're done. This is it. So we got that. You know, it's almost like going to the principal's office. So we sit down, and I had happened to know her. At the start of this church, we were able to, to put some sermons online, and she was the gal that I dealt with, and and, and so we had a, it was a smile on my face to some degree, but I also was skeptical of what was going to happen next. What came out of her mouth was nothing that I expected. She said, Bear, you and Paul, this, this little one-hour segment is, 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 is getting such, such great likes and we're getting calls. We want to put you and do a little promo about what you guys do on Thursday mornings on all the other secular radio stations that we have. She didn't use the word secular. That, that's my thought. This whole issue of the rock station and this and that and the country station. They want to do these promos because they want to draw attention and more listenership. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, Lord, this is, has to be you. This has to be your hand because the world doesn't cry for this. 
The world runs from this. And so the, the responsibility of two pastors sitting behind a mic, desiring to lift high the name. I mean, our subject last week was, was how do you get rid of sin? And of course, we, we, we talked about what it means to be a true Christian. We've, we've been talking about important things, and callers call in, and, and it's just interesting to me how, how God rises this. But I told Paul after that meeting, as we were walking to our cars, I said, it might look good today, but our heads are coming next. And so may we take advantage of the time that God has given us to exalt him and to encourage him. For this is unprecedented. And just as much as God uses unbelieving hearts to, to, to proclaim his truth, we know that it's those same hearts that will, will come and shout, crucify them. That's the preparedness that, that, that these young men found themselves in. They knew that they were living with a resolve to stand for Christ, but yet they knew possibility that their time was going to be short. And in light of that, knowing where we are with communion this morning and things, I, I just I don't want to rush this. I want to kind of walk through this. And so I want to encourage you to make sure, Lord willing, that you're here next week as we continue to unfold this. But I don't want to discourage you when you see a big outline like that that, that we're not going to get through it all. And I want to strengthen your, your understanding of what biblical faith is. And I want us to first see what it is not. Why? Because I'm concerned about popular Christianity. As I stick my nose into to other books and, and, and what preachers are preaching. And where they have taken their people. We talked a little bit about the whole issue of the prosperity gospel on that, on that radio station. And how deceptive it is to think that, that God that only desires to bless and if you don't have a blessed life, then you are not in the will of God. How silly that thought is and how unbiblical those thoughts are. And yet there's a world of Christianity that is desiring to be consumed by this idea that God blesses and that he only brings blessings. And if you don't have a blessed life, then you are doing something wrong. For that matter... They ridicule other believing Christians and, and say such things that God is not going to, to bless you unless you have greater faith. You ever heard that? Have you ever been in a trial? Have you ever been in the midst and you hear uh, believing Christians tell you that you must have greater faith for, for things to happen? And this is birthed out of it. The thought that you can have enough confidence to overcome the trial with your amount of faith. It puts onus on the person. Then the character and the person and the glory of God. And beloved, that should concern us. No wonder when the, when the storm of life hits that they forgo and forget this God who has blessed them in the past. No wonder their faith crumbles because when, when trials do happen and, and their life is, is required of them that they, they don't know what to do. Their God doesn't fit in their faith equation and, and they don't understand it. And the question you've got to ask yourself, did they really believe? Did they really believe? Or were they wanting to be, use God as their own little genie to dictate how they want the Christian life? And they want him to bow to their whims. Beloved, Jesus has already told us that difficult times will come. And it shouldn't shock us. We, when we studied 1 Peter, we saw that, the, the, the amount of sufferings that come our way. It will invade your life, including the lives of those who are most faithful. Jesus said this in John 16, 33. He says, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. Jesus never removes us from tribulations and trials. Matter of fact, James tells us what? Consider it pure joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials. Why? For the endurance of your faith, James 1, 22. And so I, I kind of want to just walk through this a little bit and, and kind of launch out of Daniel 3, but, but yet that is the premise, this unwavering faith. And you'll notice first what biblical faith is not. First, biblical faith is not based on how big your faith is. Did you get that? Biblical faith, true biblical faith, redeeming faith, is not how big your faith is. Faith is not a mind game. It's not a shuffle game. It's not a, a skills game of trying to accumulate more faith. 
Do we walk by faith? Absolutely. Don't get me wrong. But God's not looking there seeing if how much measure of faith that you have. And he's not only going to release the trial until you have that amount of faith. Faith is not trusting in how much confidence or faith that you have. But more importantly, true biblical faith is confidence and faith in the one who can make things happen. I've shared with you many times from this pulpit an experience that has stained my life to some degree. It was an experience of what we call today the, the, the faith movement where they proclaim it and name it and, and, and this whole deal. I was visiting a dear loved one up in Washington. I and my family were visiting this church. We went to their church. The pastor knew I was a pastor. He wanted me to come up front along with another visiting pastor that was preaching and himself. They had a person in the church that was full of cancer and they wanted to pray for him. I said, absolutely, I'll, I'll pray with you. And so the first pastor starts speaking in tongues and starts throwing what I seemed to like, 10W40 oil, all over this gal's head. She was dripping in this oil, I guess, to anoint her. The visiting pastor started, started preaching and, and, and just struck me as we were praying there. And I had to open my eyes because there was no agreement in my own soul to what he was saying. But he was wanting this gal to have, the only reason she had cancer was because she didn't have enough faith in the living God. And I was, I was appalled. I'm thinking, what in the world did I get myself into? And then it was my turn. Knowing the craziness of what was happening going on, I, 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 I prayed with my eyes open. I didn't know what was going to come next. But I prayed, Lord, sustain her. Give her hope. Help her to understand whatever it is, either that she dies with cancer or not, that she glorifies you. They stopped speaking in tongues. They looked at me and like, you're not a part of this group, are you? She wept. Get through the service. She sought me out and says, tell me, your faith doesn't align to what I've been, teach, been taught. Can you show me in Scripture why you prayed the way you did. And you talk about a blessed time. You talk about, about a release of understanding that it wasn't about her. She loved Christ. And she wanted the disease to go away just as much as those pastors did, but she was beaten down and trodden and felt that God was punishing her because she didn't have enough faith. I told her it wasn't up to her. It was up to God. And it wasn't up to the amount of faith that you have, but the one to whom you have faith in. Far too long, too many Christians have, have been victims of, of this fantasy that, that they must have this adequate faith to relieve them of all their difficulties. Beloved, sometimes God wants you to go through the difficulties of life. Because he knows that that difficulty will give him greater glory and give you stronger faith in the midst of it. You've heard me say when we taught through 1 Peter to embrace the trial and trust in the God of the trial. That's exactly what's at, at stake here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they were trusting in this living God. And don't ever think that you're a lesser Christian if you have cancer, if you have disease, if you have trials. You're not. You're not. Why? Because God is wiser. And he is full of sovereign love and merciful grace to be able to sustain you through whatever trial you have. True biblical faith simply acknowledges and trusts that God knows and does what is right and according to his will. Simple definition. True biblical faith simply is acknowledgement of trust and trust God who knows what our tomorrows are about. And does what is according to his will. Yes, difficulties may still arise, but he enables us to embrace them and, and sustains us through them. Grief might come, absolutely. Depression, absolutely. Wondering if it, it's, is it a part of you? Probably. That's just the weakness of who we are as, as human beings, but understand that our 
faith is in the rock who is higher than I. True biblical faith says, not my will, but yours be done. And beloved, we live in a fallen world where illness and difficulties and tragedies will happen until Christ returns. We're not immune to those things. We're not immune to the consequences of what those disease and trials and heartbreaks bring. We live in a broken and depraved world. And so God forbid and shut the mouths of those preachers who, who think that it's all about you and your faith. It's about a God who's going to come back and reign. I'm disturbed by the fact that they teach that you must have this heroic, heroic uh, degree of faith and that will prevent you from trials and tragedies of this life. It's not the case. But do we cling to the rock? I quoted James earlier, James 1, 2. It says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Of course, God can remove disease. That's not what I'm saying. God heals miraculously. He does. But don't be shocked if he desires for you to go through the trial. He will sustain you. And he will give you hope. Choice is his. Choice really isn't yours. Choice is his. And he does everything according to his character. And scripture tells us that he's always good and always kind and always trustworthy. Real, true biblical faith is, is not in the amount of your faith you have, but in the confidence in our God. Psalm 34 8. The, the, the psalm that we read this morning, the psalmist proclaim, O taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. A very familiar verse out of Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that God causes all things, and you think about all things, that's the good and the bad. He causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And the prophet Nahum, and, and Nahum uh, chapter 1, verse 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. Love it. That's what, that's what Daniel 3 teaches us. This is the faith of three young men, three young Hebrew boys, and it must be ours as well. Thinking through our time and what's left, we're going to pick this up, like I said, next week. But I just want that to settle in your mind as we head to the Lord's table. The question is, when adversity comes, how do you live? Is there resolve in your heart? Just take a stand for what is right and what is good. I'm amazed, like I said earlier, of how God would put us in places, but never to be restricted of the goodness and the kindness of God. Is He the substance of your faith? Or do you trust in yourself? Those are the questions that we got to answer as we continue to work our way through what true biblical faith is. Am I at the center of my faith? Have I created my own Christianity? Have I created my own God? And when things go outside of that, it rocks you. And I praise God that if you're that person who has created a God that are outside the realms of the scriptures, that he rocks your world. And may it drive you to a hope in the living God, and what true biblical faith is, and may you see the character of God in the midst of your trials and your ad adversities, and may you exalt in his goodness and kindness.